Perfect. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, greetings from Southern California. I hope it's nice and sunny wherever you are. Um, as I was thinking about putting this presentation together, I wanted to do my best to make it as relevant as possible to the um, sports nutrition slash exercise um, researchers and practitioners that make hey, up Rick. the ISSM. And what's the stupid, uh, the, uh, what the hell's going on with Cross? They're losing the black belt. Is well, that? 14 uh... to stuff. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I think that was Bill's microphone was still on. So I. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so I've uh, I tried to do that near the end of the presentation. Um, every piece of data that I will show you today are from randomized placebo controlled trials. So there, nothing is without uh, appropriate research design to the extent that um, they're controlled and subjects are randomized. And in some, but not all of the cases, the individuals serving as study participants are um, appropriately chosen. So with, with that, uh, I'll continue with a little background later, talk to you about the only approved medical uses for testosterone. And of course we go way, way beyond that with non-medical uses. Um, the effects on muscle performance, uh, body composition, factors that affect the efficacy of uh, testosterone treatment. And then talk, as I said, a little bit about a alter alternate approaches for treating um, a big worldwide condition that has got everybody fired up right now, and that's sarcopenia. So the two slides you see, the, the slide on the right is a much simpler version of uh, the slide on the left. These are from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging from uh, over 20 years ago, but not much has changed since then with respect to declining levels of testosterone uh, as people age. Uh, another piece of background that I should have mentioned is for the most part, these are studies done in men. And to clarify that as best as I can, these are um, men who are assigned men at birth or assigned males at birth. I don't know if, if that's true, certainly none of our studies, but um, in general, as far as we know, these were male participants. So what we see is a decrease in, of serum testosterone between one and about one and a half percent per year. So if a person was somewhere in the mid-range of normal, around 600 nanograms per deciliter by age, I'm sorry, that's not, shouldn't be 30, it's after um, 40 years of aging. By the time that person is age 70, they would have a, on average, a serum level of 384. Keep that number in mind as we have a look at what low testosterone really means. So normal testosterone has well-defined effects in men and to a much lesser level in women. And these you're well aware of, um, development of secondary sexual characteristics, muscle mass, mass sense of well-being, reproduction, bone density, and, and so on. Um, symptoms that are suggestive of low testosterone are seen here. And typically, these are the reasons why men go to their doctor when they're 
50 some years old and uh, a little bit older, they just don't feel real well. You know, they're, they don't have as much, and I shouldn't say they, we don't have as much uh, energy as uh, at earlier times in their life. And they may have uh, some depression. They may be getting uh, inappropriately overweight for uh, reasons not necessarily related to uh, energy balance. So what does low testosterone mean? It's well-defined by these three groups, but as you can see, they're not in total agreement. The most recent guideline is from 2018 in the Endocrine Society's clinical practice guidelines, putting low testosterone at 264 nanograms per deciliter or 9.2 nanomoles per liter. That's low, unequivocally low as uh, we've experienced. Um, American Urological Association calls it 300, European Male Aging Study, a little higher. And as you remember a previous slide with um, the expected annual decline in testosterone, a male aging from 30 to 70 might go down to 384. Well, at, at that point, he still would be considered uh, at least low normal uh, testosterone. He would be in the normal range for his age. He may have symptoms, so what do you do about that? That's the big question that people are struggling with right now. There's only one approved application, and that is to treat primary hypogonadism, and that's due to problems uh, in the testes. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is a problem somewhere between the hypothalamus pituitary and the testes, and it takes a little more investigation to figure out where that problem is and how best to treat it. But this is the only approved um, use for testosterone. And in order to follow through with treatment, for these conditions, there is a, a very detailed and long, long algorithm that clinicians would go through in order to establish the need to treat. So far, that's all we have uh, in terms of medical uses. There are a boatload of um, uh, approved applications that you can see here. Um, they are for male contraception is proven. There's some second line therapies for um, uh, renal and bone marrow failure, osteoporosis, uh, HIV wasting. Uh, in the transgender applications, it's widely accepted as a standard of care. Um, and there are mod modest efficacy and in some other areas as well, such as treatment of depression. There's a ton of non-medical uses for um, what might be called functional hypogonadism. Um, and it's a significant misuse. And the labels you've seen on television, in advertisements, the advertisement to the left, uh, uh, doctor, and to the right, Dr. Antonio will appreciate it's from South Florida. So it's no different than what's going on in Southern California and a lot of other places, uh, at least in our country, um, which is a, among the two highest users of testosterone, the other being Canada. Um, people are talking about sarcopenia and are maybe splitting hairs uh, to be uh, a little conservative in that statement with the word dynapenia. Uh, sarcopenia primarily refers to loss of muscle mass, whereas dynapenia, dynapenia 
includes loss of muscle strength. Well, in a few minutes, I'll show you what the newest definition of sarcopenia uh, has been decided and how they've blended those two words. So in 2015, the FDA would not recognize functional hypogonadism as a genuine disease and therefore uh, did not approve testosterone as a treatment. In 2018, in fact, they recommended against the routine uh, administration of testosterone to men over age 65 with low serum T. And at that point, a lot of the concern was for cardiovascular effects. Since then, what's that, about six years worth of study, there have been many um, pieces of research that have identified a much safer uh, attitude towards uh, the use of testosterone regarding cardiovascular conditions. Uh, if you have time to look up the very recent Traverse trial that was um, done specifically to study uh, testosterone's effect on the heart and vasculature, um, you'll see uh, conclusions that uh, did not support uh, the increased risk of testosterone. So uh, image enhancement is um, one of the main reasons that particularly young men are interested in testosterone for a while. Uh, it was a big problem in high schools. And uh, in about 19, uh, 2013 or 2014, that started, started to decrease a little bit, but we still see a lot of abuse in um, high school students and their goal to um, get bigger and in their opinion, look better. One of our colleagues, a psychiatrist at Harvard, uh, Skip Pope, refers to particularly the people on the right as muscle, muscle dysmorphia. Um, take that as you will. I find it very interesting to see what amounts to about a 60 year difference in the look of Mr. America, Mr. Universe. Um, on the far left is Steve Reeves, Superman. Next to him is George Efferman. Um, those guys were considered pretty big for their time. Uh, I do not know if they were taking steroids. It's possible steroids came into great interest in the States uh, right around the mid 1950s with uh, the 56 Olympic Games. So testosterone is also used to enhance physical performance. And I'm not telling this group anything you don't know. Um, here are uh, many, many reasons uh, that people like to use testosterone for all of these improved uh, performance abilities. What I also find interesting is the psychological uh, effects in some people, not necessarily all people, with respect to increased uh, competitiveness, what the psycho psychologists call dominance striving, the need to dominate uh, an opponent, uh, reduced empathy, and to uh, a lesser degree, improvements in aerobic capacity. And in our experience, uh, it's, it's a small change that is more like a reduction in the age-related expected decline in aerobic uh, capacity. To the right are some of the users that are more prevalent than others in uh, athletics. I'm sure I've missed uh, a couple, but you're aware of these things and people are using testosterone and we have no idea what the prevalence of this is. There's so much underground 
back room use, we just we just don't know. Um, so, oops, this is a really key slide for any of you who might be interested in studying testosterone or other promyogenic therapies. Um, this is a list of the mistakes that people make in their research, choosing the type of testosterone. What is the route of delivery? What is the dose? Is there a dose adjustment uh, over time? What is the baseline serum level? Are we testing, frankly, low normal people, or are we, or are we uh, treating men somewhere around 400 nanograms per deciliter? Are we going to see the same effect if we administer testosterone to that uh, group, those two groups of people? How long is uh, the administration? Is there adequate statistical power to observe the change that you're really interested in? Um, so many studies are powered for a primary outcome variable, yet other outcomes are reported um, without necessary power to come to a real conclusion. And of course, related to power is sample size. Um, and that's often a financial problem. Uh, colleges and universities are taking more in indirect costs. Funding agencies are giving us less money. Um, so that directly affects uh, the size of uh, samples that, that we can uh, get. They're, to get adequate sample sizes now, we're looking in the millions and millions of dollars. What are the participant characteristics? If you want to study the effects of testosterone in mobility-limited older men, they should be mobility-limited by some objective criteria. And if they're tested for that with an objective test, it should probably be duplicated to be sure that, in fact, you have a mobility-limited participant. What are your outcome measures? Uh, I think that, that a study we were involved in called the testosterone trials made a huge mistake in the outcome measure for the physical function part of the trial. Uh, we were swayed into um, using a six minute walk test. And you think about a six minute walk test at uh, a normal gait, is testosterone really going to affect performance in that test? Well, it turned out it didn't. Um, many of us were interested in using another functional measure that was would have been more responsive to testosterone, such as stair climbing. So we need we need to start working on some consistency across our research studies. Uh, there's a movement in that direction, but it's certainly very slow. And until we get more consistency in controlling for these variables, we're going to have a tougher time coming to some real conclusions. So regarding um, the types and modes of delivery, we see injectables and gels and uh, patches and oral agents. Um, the oral agents typically require uh, a first pass through the liver, so it increases liver toxicity. Gels and patches don't seem to be as effective as the injectables. Uh, the two at the top of the list for inject injectables, uh, testosterone, cypionate, and enanthate are uh, of the preferred variety. Uh, the typical dose level that you see there that might be a little bit high. We consider replacement doses of testosterone, and we use enanthate 
almost exclusively uh, is 100 um, milligrams per week and then dosed ad adjusted uh, accordingly. So I have a slide um, in a little while, I think, that um, shows some evidence for why the injectables are more well preferred in terms of generating um, an effect. Well, what are some effects on muscle? So this study sort of got people in agreement that in fact, testosterone actually does work to increase muscle size and muscle strength. This was a, a study that we did after evaluating, I think every piece of testosterone research up to the point uh, where we designed this study. We looked for the flaws in the study and tried to correct them. So we showed that the uh, a group that received a large dose of testosterone, 600 milligrams per week for 10 weeks, plus underwent heavy resistance training uh, three times a week, had a large increase in both triceps and quadriceps cross-sectional area. We really focused on um, the free weight bench press and the squat with uh, very, very experienced lifters who we had wash out for a couple of months before we started them training. NEP is no exercise placebo. And you can see their cross-sectionally decreased. No exercise testosterone. This was a big surprise to us and sort of made the case for testosterone being effective by itself in increasing um, muscle size. The exercise placebo group was also surprising uh, to me, at least for the triceps cross-sectional area, uh, a little better response for uh, the quads. And of course, um, the exercise testosterone group saw big changes. And we see a, a similar uh, pattern with changes in muscle strength in both the bench press and the squat, where the combination of exercise plus testosterone turned out to be more than additive. So the effect of testosterone plus the effect of exercise um, was exceeded when you combine those two treatments. So again, in a, with a very large dose of testosterone, um, we see a big effectiveness. Now we call this big, um, but people who are abusing it for other purposes than, um, than medical or treating sarcopenia, are taking much more than this and stacking various types of um, anabolic agents. So we wanted to know then, what if you graded the doses? Do we see a proportional increase? So we looked at six different doses. And as you can see for, um, in this study, the um, doses that we gave, 2551, 2500, 600 uh, milligrams per week, achieved high levels of uh, serum testosterone. For example, the um, younger men had serum testosterone levels between 650 and 700, as I recall. Men uh, older men were a little bit higher, and that's because their clearance of testosterone isn't as great. More of um, their testosterone is bound up to um, a binding globulin. So we also see a dose response 
in measures of leg press strength and leg press power. So as you know, power is an extremely important muscle performance variable uh, as we think about physical function. The things that a person does every day and uh, participation in recreational and competitive sports requires power. So the speed with which one can exert force has turned out to be actually more important than strength for certain levels of performance. And once again, we see uh, a dose uh, relationship here. For the 600 milligram dose in the older men, we had to stop that dose because of um, the number of adverse events were beginning to exceed uh, no adverse events in that group. So we were asked to stop that group. So it affected uh, the outcome, particularly in the power uh, area. Dose response, testosterone works. And um, I think we answered that question. Um, so what about changes in muscle strength, cross-sectional area with testosterone or placebo plus varying levels of intensity of resistance training? This was a study done by Dennis Sullivan um, several years ago. And the low intensity exercise was very, very low, something like 20% of the 1RM. Um, the high intensity of, of course, much higher in the 70 to 80% of 1RM. So they combined that with uh, 100 milligrams per week of testosterone. And you can see that for um, the leg press, uh, in terms of absolute change. What is, uh, so the first absolute change is uh, for the biceps. So we see a, a little bit of improvement in the low intensity exercise groups and the improvement gets higher um, with exercise alone and with uh, the addition of testosterone. So there was a significant exercise effect, but at least to me, a little surprisingly, no drug effect. For the leg press, um, a similar outcome. The largest increase was for the, the high intensity PRT group, um, but it was followed pretty close by, by um, the high intensity exercise group alone and a similar pattern with um, uh, uh, change in the mid-thigh cross-sectional area. So I'd really like you to keep that in mind for several minutes now so that when we get to some applications for all of us, um, we might see that maybe we're focusing on the wrong anabolic agent in treating um, diseases such as sarcopenia, or for that matter, most chronic diseases in which men have low levels of testosterone. So um, we're going to see just a repeating theme here. Um, this is change in leg press strength after 16 weeks of what we refer to as a replacement dose of testosterone, 100 milligrams per week or placebo plus resistance training in men living with HIV. Uh, same pattern that we saw with the uh, younger men, when you combine exercise and testosterone, you get a large effect. The exercise alone uh, effect on change from baseline in the leg press was not significantly different from the combined group. And those who 
uh, received no exercise with their testosterone um, got about half the improvement. So the symbols refer to uh, differences uh, from the no exercise placebo group, the same symbol refuse uh, across the three groups refers to differences from the no exercise testosterone group. So uh, uh, a nice consistent story here with the combination of testosterone and strength training. Um, similar pattern in men with COPD. We combine exercise and testosterone and we get the biggest effect. Um, however, exercise alone with a placebo also has uh, a significant effect. In this case, changes in uh, leg press uh, strength by one RM and uh, changes in repetitions to failure. This is the only study in which we have seen a significant improvement in reps to failure. This is where we take 80% of the one repetition maximum previously assessed generally twice and ask the subject to come in on a separate day and do as many repetitions through the full range of motion as possible um, to get this measure of fatigability. So the combination of exercise and testosterone um, appears to be helpful. It wasn't significantly better than exercise placebo, however. Um, also men in COPD, showing you a little bit now on the body composition with respect to change in lean body mass on the top uh, and change in fat mass on the bottom. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, effect, particularly of testosterone. And I'll try to explain that a little more fully um, uh, in a little while. But again, um, the combination of exercise and testosterone um, seems to be uh, beneficial. This is um, a summary of a study done in mobility limited older men, men over age 65 with low or low normal testosterone. Mobility limitation was determined with the SPPB. Uh, short physical performance battery. And they received 100 milligrams per week of testosterone. Their serum testosterone levels at baseline were, uh, they averaged about 306. So right on uh, the borderline back in uh, 2008 or so when we did this study. So all of these measures tend to favor use of uh, testosterone rather than placebo. Um, what about longer times? So this is a project in which we used uh, healthy men, healthy older men who received uh, testosterone or placebo gel uh, for three years no exercise. And what we see here, uh, the blue line is the gel, the dotted line is the placebo. And over three years, 36 months, there was a significant difference in that long-term effect of testosterone. Uh, the thing that isn't particularly appealing to me after this treatment is they, for both leg press and chest press, at the end of three years, they tended to come back to normal. So, uh, to, or to baseline. So to me, this sort of suggests that if we wanna sustain an improvement with testosterone, we should be thinking about some other sort of um, anabolic therapy. 
This is a change in grip strength over three years. The arrows point to baseline levels and the 36 month level for the change in hand grip with testosterone alone. Uh, the small dotted line uses testosterone and uh, finasteride um, uh, as an experiment. They're looking to see if finasteride blunted the effect of, of testosterone, and it turns out that it did not. Um, in a tree plot here uh, for right hand grip strength, uh, mean difference in change across these uh, four randomized controlled uh, trials shows an average increase of about three or so kilograms. So these were studies of varying lengths and with different types of testosterone. I think you'll find that seeing this uh, difference has uh, some impact on what is being done with sarcopenia definitions. So quickly now through some body composition, um, real similar patterns with changes in the fat-free mass in men receiving the big dose of uh, testosterone plus uh, exercise training. <coughs> so the blue bars and the green bars show us the biggest effect. <clears throat> so it tells us that testosterone alone can give us about three or so um, kilograms of fat-free mass increase. Uh, if you take uh, that large level of testosterone and add exercise to it, uh, a much bigger value. We typically don't see any values of that size in, um, in our older male study. There's a dose response relationship that is not different between older and younger men. Um, so this is another type of body composition partition. This is bone. So this is an analysis on testosterone's effect on bone health, in, in this particular case, uh, bone density. So not a large effect, but um, at least for the group who received intermuscular injections, um, a more substantial effect than the group that received uh, transdermal applications in, in which there was hardly any effect at all. The three-year trial, um, not only did we see uh, an improvement, albeit small, um, total lean body mass was less than a kilo after three years and only reached a kilo um, at its peak. Uh, the placebo group declined for a little while and, and then came back. By the way, these were all DEXA measured um, body composition variables. This is a, a tree plot again, a forest plot of the mean change over a number of studies. And it suggests that there's roughly uh, an increase of three kilograms of lean body mass change with um, testosterone. And this is typically uh, replacement doses of about 100 milligrams um, per week. Um, okay, we've seen that one. We've seen that one. Oh, I'm going backwards, aren't I? Okay, uh, changes in fat mass, just the reverse. So bigger doses of testosterone, bigger loss in fat mass for both older and younger men. So there was, in this case, a significant age effect as well as a dose effect. 
here's why we think that um, testosterone helps muscle grow and uh, fat decrease. Testosterone stimulates um, satellite cells and pluripotent stem cells. Those then um, are affected uh, and become mesenchymal multipotent stem cells. And they're directed either into a fat cell lineage or into a muscle cell lineage. And this is where testosterone helps to guide that uh, diversion. Testosterone is available and active. It stimulates the satellite cells and increased uh, size of myoblast, uh, myosin heavy chain, and myotubes. If, um, if it's not, then we tend to, if, if it's low, testosterone is low, then um, we tend to move more towards um, the fat lineage. So sarcopenia, it's a global problem amongst aging individuals, um, characterized by loss of lean mass, strength, and physical function. This non-medical use of testosterone to treat sarcopenia is presently undergoing worldwide intense investigation. The Sarcopenia Definition and Outcomes Consortium was put together by the NIA, National Institutes on Aging, um, to develop an evidence-based definition of sarcopenia. And they determined that grip strength and gait speed were the key variables. They uh, independently predict adverse health outcomes, mobility limitations, uh, limitations, falls, mortality. Muscle weakness, therefore, should be included in the definition of sarcopenia. And usual gait speed should be included, as it is the most important patient reported outcome. Grip strength, gait speed, and lean mass. Well, the key point here is that weakness defined by low great grip strength and slowness should be included, but lean mass measured by DEXA should not. It is not independently associated with um, mobility limitations, mortality, and the other uh, factors we saw earlier. So I think some people were very surprised at this, um, that lean body mass doesn't uh, predict these uh, changes due to sarcopenia, uh, as well as grip strength. Um, I could talk to you all day about grip strength um, not necessarily positively, but it certainly has been shown to be associated with everything from plaid shoelaces to sliced white bread. Um, other factors that um, can be considered as function promoting therapies that are associated with aging and chronic disease, very certainly nutrition, and you are the experts in this arena, uh, I don't think there has been a well done study that has combined, uh, I, I take that back, Dennis uh, Villarreal has done some really nice work with nutrition and uh, anabolic agents. Amino acids, <clears throat> at one time we considered that older people had anabolic resistance <clears throat> I think that has fallen out of some disfavor, although a number of older adults still are deficient in their protein intake, as well as uh, carbohydrate, and it's therefore its effects on protein turnover 
and uh, insulin secretion. Uh, HMB has shown to, to positively affect uh, muscle uh, creatine monohydrate. I think it's one of the two or three uh, supplements or nutraceuticals that uh, has been shown to be effective, at least at some level. Vitamin D and uh, omega-3s primarily as uh, anti-inflammatories. And then there's resistance training. Um, you know, we know resistance training works and uh, it doesn't have many side effects. The big problem is choosing the right type of resistance training. Uh, can it be designed so that improves function? I don't want to talk about functional training at all. I mean, I'm still not sure I know what that means, but training to improve a specific task. That's what athletes do. Why can't we make older people adults too? Uh, there should be task specific exercise that is important to uh, older people. Walking is one, stair climbing is uh, another. Um, this is a comparison of changes in physical function with anabolic drugs versus placebo in 15 randomized controlled trials. Uh, I couldn't put, there was no space to put the names of the trials, so I just numbered them if anybody is interested in the slide deck or in, in the uh, references that I'm alluding to here that uh, I'm happy to share those with you. Um, the pluses in the green shaded areas indicate that there was a positive uh, effect, a significant change in the measure due to um, testosterone uh, or some other anabolic agent uh, administration. But you see that the negatives far outnumber the, um, the positives in these randomized controlled trials. So we really have to wonder whether testosterone is the right choice. So is testosterone the end all? of pro-myogenic and function, uh, functional therapies, function-promoting therapies. Um, we believe that we need to take some action. The things that are being done now is the pharmaceutical industry is all over this. Uh, the NIA uh, convened a meeting this past, uh, actually it was, yeah, this past uh, March um, on what can we do to improve treatment of sarcopenia. So new drugs are being developed for that purpose. Um, we talk about the use of adjunctive therapies such as exercise and nutrition. So to you all, I would ask, is there an interest here for you? You're the experts in nutrition with I'm sure a carryover into exercise as well. What can you do to help further our mission in helping to improve uh, anabolic therapies for people who really need it uh, down the road? So with that, I say thank you very much.